Welcome everyone to our virtual 2021 PWS Family Conference presented by Seleno. Today's session is one of my favorites of our conference programming. It really shows us as a community the opportunities that we have to help accelerate research and bring treatments to our loved ones with PWS. In today's clinical trials update session, we have presentations from six currently recruiting and upcoming PWS clinical trials. Each representative will provide you with a brief overview of their trial and eligibility criteria. As we have time, we'll have one or two trial specific questions for each presenter, but we will reserve the majority of your questions for Q&A, which will be held towards the end of the session. To begin today's session and provide you with a quick overview of PWS clinical trials, I give you FPWR's Director of Research Programs, Dr. Teresa Strong. Thank you, Susan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited about the number of clinical trials that we have ongoing in the PWS community and the challenges that they're, they're addressing with these new potential therapeutics. What we're focusing on today is kind of the middle of this slide, the clinical trials where we're taking drugs that have shown some efficacy in animal models or in cells with PWS, and we're, now it's the opportunity to test them in individuals with PWS. And these go through a series of clinical trials uh, to get to the point where the company that is sponsoring the study feels like they have enough data to show that the drug is safe and that the drug is effective in addressing whichever challenge that drug is addressing. Um, and we'll give that information to the FDA seeking drug approval so that everyone in the community can have it. On the next slide, Susan, you can see the different phases of clinical trials. I'm just going to go through this briefly. My point here mainly is to point you in the direction of resources. So if you that you want to learn more, um, you, you know where to find things. Um, but uh, the trials that we're talking about today are uh, phase one, two, or three. Uh, typically, a phase one clinical trial is when the drug is first tested in humans, um, and it's the first opportunity to make sure that the drug is behaving the way you think it's going to behave and that there are no unexpected safety issues. Um, then drugs move into phase two in rare disease. This can be a trial of, um, you know, 20 or 50 individuals, maybe 100 or, or a little bit more, uh, depending on the trial and the goal of the trial. And phase two trials are really looking at whether the drug is doing uh, what it's meant to do. So is there efficacy and is there sufficient efficacy for it to be meaningful to patients? It also uh, typically uh, exposes the patient to the drug for a longer period so we can make sure that there's, again, that the safety is uh, as expected. Um, and these are typically randomized control trials, meaning that some individuals will get the drug and some individuals will get a placebo control and then you'll compare the group. And finally, in phase three, these are sometimes called pivotal trials. And it is a larger trial, typically for a longer amount of time, again, randomized, uh, controlled with a placebo control to really demonstrate the benefits of the drug, as well as assess, again, the safety in a larger population so that the information can be given to the FDA that hopefully shows that the benefits of the drug outweigh the risks of the drug. Um, there are also clinical trials, and, and we'll talk about one of those today, that are using drugs that have already been approved, so post-approval or repurposing, where a drug um, that is used for one purpose, for example, guanfacine, which is approved for use in ADHD, is being now tried in a different population, the PWS population, to, uh, to mitigate some of the aggression and impulse controls that sometimes occurs in PWS. Next slide. So we're really fortunate, uh, next slide, yeah. <laughs> we're really fortunate to have a number of clinical trials ongoing and our biggest challenge as a community is to get these trials enrolled and, you know, and, and um, get them done and see if these uh, different treatments are safe and effective in our kids. And, uh, you know, this is something that nobody can do except us. I think, um, you know, this is a case where we can't wait for the Calvary. We are the Calvary. We have, you know, we're the only people that can get this done. So what we hope to do is give you the information that you need to decide whether a clinical trial is right for you. I mean, that 
obviously is a really personal decision. You have to weigh all the, the potential benefits and the potential risks and make that decision. But we really hope that beginning with this session, you know, you'll start learning and really seriously um, the weighing those, those uh, risks and benefits. So next slide. So what are some of the benefits and risks that you should think about in considering enrolling in a clinical trial? Well, the benefits include uh, early access to a new potentially effective treatment. Uh, for example, we have both Salino and uh, um, uh, Levo have completed phase three clinical trials now. There are PWS uh, participants who have been on those drugs now for, for more than two years and are continuing on those, those drugs. And that's before it is those drugs hopefully will be available to the entire PWS population. So uh, potentially, you know, years of access to a, a new therapeutic. Also, uh, we found personally, you know, as you go to these clinical trial sites, it helps you build a relationship with a PWS clinical expert, and that can be helpful uh, for many reasons. Your child is never as well monitored as during a clinical trial, so even picking up, you know, other challenges or other, uh, you know, medically important issues uh, can be an advantage. Travel costs are typically covered, especially for the later stage uh, trials that are sponsored by companies. And um, also companies, especially through the pandemic, have really adapted to doing as much as possible remotely, which is actually much easier on our families, uh, not having to travel you know, across state lines, uh, for example, for a clinic visit. So I think all of the, uh, the sponsors have really tried to incorporate that as much as possible into their clinical trial designs. Um, you know, and in the big picture, you're helping our community understand whether a drug is safe and effective in our population. And on a personal level, you're getting to see if that drug is uh, beneficial to your loved one with PWS. But of course, there are risks. A drug might not work. So it is a big investment of time and energy. And, you know, you might not see a benefit. Um, and in clinical trials, the, uh, the full risks of the drug are, are typically not necessarily known. Next slide. Um, but you should feel really comfortable that there are a lot of safety measures in place. So the FDA reviews all of the, um, the animal data, the cell data, and the initial uh, phase one data before allowing a phase two or phase three trial to move forward. In addition, the study team, the, the, the clinician who's gonna be doing the study has access to all of the information about that drug. And I think you know, we can feel really comfortable that our PWS expert clinicians um, you know, are not going to be uh, doing a clinical trial where they don't feel that the benefits are likely to outweigh the risks. At, the, at each institution, at each medical center where they do the drug, there's an institutional review board that oversees and there's also typically a data safety monitoring board that is looking at the data as it comes in on a clinical trial and they're independent and they have the authority to stop a trial, you know, if they see anything that needs to be resolved. Next slide. Um, so the question comes down to, you know, should I enroll my loved one in PWS in a clinical trial? We ask you again to learn about the clinical trials, speak to your doctor, and then speak to the study team at a potential site. You can talk to the study coordinator about the logistics, you know, how many visits and how long does it take. You can talk to the clinician about what are the risks, what are the potential benefits, what should I be looking out for, and then make the decision that's right for you. Um, so next slide, what questions should you be asking when considering a clinical trial? The, we'll send these slides around. It has some links to um, resources that can help you formulate those questions before you, uh, you know, talk to the investigator and to the study site so that you feel like you've got all of your questions answered. Next slide. On the FPWR website, we also have a lot of resources that we hope will be helpful. Um, Susan keeps a very up-to-date list of what's recruiting where, and as new sites come online, she adds those, and you can look at the map and see where the sites are near you. We have an FAQ download. We have a clinical trial alert newsletter that you can sign up for and get uh, information about new clinical trials. And if you're in the global PWS registry and you've checked that we can contact you, we'll send you information about clinical trials that are recruiting. 
Uh, we also have on our YouTube channel um, experiences of parents who have participated in clinical trials, as well as longer videos that really go into the clinical trial process if you want to learn more. Next slide. Um, so we're really excited to hear about all of the different trials that are ongoing, and they're really spanning all of those things uh, that are really important to us in PWS. So we know not every child has every challenge, but um, many different challenges are being addressed with new therapeutics. So the hyperphagia, the anxiety, the sleep problems, and the cog cognitive challenges. They are all being addressed through these different medications. And so I, without further ado, I will turn it over to our next speaker to start telling you about these actual trials. So I'm proud to uh, introduce you today to Dr. Deepan Singh. He's going to be our first presenter. Um, he'll be discussing guanfacine, which is an FPWR supported clinical trial. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for joining us. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Strong. And uh, thank you so much for uh, to FBWR for uh, sponsoring this study. Uh, I have, as many of you who've attended these conferences year after year, you might have heard about guanfacine extended release in uh, a couple of times. Uh, but uh, this is the first time that I'm presenting this uh, since we've actually started the, the study and we have quite a few patients already enrolled and uh, we are enrolling uh, as we speak. So let's go to the next slide, uh, just to review a little bit about what guanfacine is. So the whole purpose for this, uh, you know, for this, as you heard from Dr. Strong, this is the only, um, uh, you know, medicine that we discussed today, which is already FDA approved. So this has a lot of safety uh, data and it is FDA approved for the treatment of ADHD, which is a very common, the, the most common psychiatric uh, uh, disorder which for which medications are needed in childhood. So it's obviously been around for a long time and a lot of patients have successfully been treated with it. So uh, when I started treating patients with PWS over seven years ago, uh, I, I wanted to use something which does not affect the, uh, you know, the serotonin, dopamine, and the usual suspects in psychiatry, because uh, I was uh, concerned about the potential side effects. And, and that brought me to sort of that nar narrowed uh, the scope of uh, medicines to something that is, is a little different. So this uh, medicine actually works uh, on the postsynaptic norepinephrine receptor. Long story short, it works by increasing the activity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the executive functioning, uh, you know, the chairman of the brain, so to speak, uh, which helps control impulses and reduce hyperactivity. Uh, and and uh, by reducing impulsivity in particular, um, it is, you know, uh, it has been shown to reduce uh, skin picking and, and self-injurious and, and aggressive behavior. So we'll talk a bit more about uh, some of the early studies that I conducted. Now, um, there, uh, as, as I mentioned, in addition to ADHD, it has also uh, evidence in working uh, for against ADHD and impulsivity and aggression in patients with autism. And as many of you would know, autism is commonly comorbid with uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, after my initial uh, about 27 patients that I treated with, uh, with guanfacine, and this is a, a quite a, a, a few years ago, we noticed a significant improvement in skin picking, aggression, and symptoms of ADHD. So over 80% of patients with skin picking showed an improvement. Uh, over 80% showed an improvement in aggression mm -hmm. agitation, and over 90% showed an improvement in ADHD, which was expected because it is an ADHD medicine. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next slide. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing uh, now, now that we have mm -hmm. that anecdotal evidence, now remember, this is an FDA-approved medicine. It's already available in the market. So, uh, so why do we need to do the clinical trial? And what I realized that because there's so few psychiatrists who are familiar with PWS, their, their first line treatment, the first medicine that they choose, instead of choosing something like guanfacine, they would choose something like, like an SSRI, something like Selexa or 
uh, escitalopram or Zoloft and things like that, uh, and which can be problematic because the, the, the serotonin receptor functioning and the neurotransmitter systems in PWS is very different from patients without PWS. So that, that causes side effects. So I can understand as a general psychiatrist who, who would be unfamiliar with PWS, the first choices would be things like antipsychotics, which cause, which cause a lot of weight gain, or stimulant medications, which can increase skin picking, or uh, you know, antidepressant type medicines, which can cause cycloid psychosis in some patients with PWS. I mean, a lot of our patients, a lot of you all and, and your loved ones are on those medicines, and, and they're, sometimes there are good reasons to be on them. But sometimes it's because they don't know, uh, they're not familiar, they're not, uh, they don't use this medicine commonly and they, they kind of default to the ones that they use more frequently. I don't blame them. The, the way to stop that from happening is to increase awareness about the way this medicine helps. Uh, and so to, to confirm my findings uh, in, my, in my practice with, with my patients, uh, FPWR has kindly helped me design this study, which is a double-blind placebo-controlled. It's, it's a 16-week trial. We can actually uh, see the next uh, slide also. So it's a 16-week uh, um, trial. The first eight weeks is placebo-controlled. So the, the uh, patient might be on placebo or the medication, but it's flexible dosing. So the most common side effect of this medicine, which I'm seeing already with some of my patients, which is like common, is that there's an initial increase in sleepiness. And as you know, a lot of our patients with PWS have excessive daytime sleepiness, but then that tends to go down after the first week. So people get tol uh, people tolerate the medicine better. And that's something that is seen even in patients without PWS. For the first week, they're a little sleepy. Each time we increase the dosage, they're a little sleepy. And then as soon as I find the minimum effective dose, I don't increase it any further. So it's not like a fixed dose we have to keep going up, right? Uh, similarly, there are times when I have reduced the dose, when we tried a higher dose, and then we went back down because we are, you know, because it's not, it's not a company funded trial, we have that flexibility uh, because I'm not trying to determine what dosage works best. We already know that from studies done in other patients. Um, so, so it's a very exciting time. We have, uh, you know, and we have an open labeled phase towards the end where patients are on both uh, uh, anybody who, who was on the placebo are given the option to continue being on the medicine for another eight weeks. Um, and it, it, it's, it's helpful. And again, uh, we are enrolling right now. Let's go to the last slide, please. I know I'm uh, limited on time. So we are enrolling patients right now. And uh, now is a good time because, you know, I, uh, I want to complete this and let, uh, let people know. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, because people are not familiar, even though it's available uh, in the markets, people are not utilizing it and it's hard to. So I have patients coming from all over the United States, New Mexico, all over the Northeast, of course. Um, only three of the visits are in person. Most of the visits will be uh, via video with me and uh, with our coordinator and with our uh, director of research, Dr. Sreesa Jacob, who you should reach out to. The number and the email is given right here for more information. Uh, I've, I had only seven minutes and I've gone over time. So I'm gonna stop now and hopefully there'll be time for questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Singh. We greatly appreciate that information. There, there is interest in, um, in, in guanfacine for using, um, for some of the symptoms. Um, one, one parent had a question about um, co, uh, farm, using another drug at the same time. Can Vyvanse be used while, while using guanfacine as well? Yes, yes. So as long as the child or the, or the patient is on a stable dosage of the medicine, they, the only exception to that would be if they're already on guanfacine, uh, you know, or, or, and if they're on clonidine, which is commonly prescribed, we will guide you on how to wash it, wash, uh, wash it off safely before you enroll in the study. So we've done that safely in a couple of patients because it's similar, all the clonidine is very short acting, so it doesn't work the same way. So yes, most medicines are going to be safe to continue uh, with this medicine. Great. And can you confirm the ages of eligibility for your study? Six to 36. Thank you. And if people have questions regarding other eligibility um, criteria, they can reach out to Dr. Teresa Jacob, who's listed on this slide, correct? Yes. And that phone number as well. Yeah. 
Wonderful. These slides will be made available for everyone after the con after the conference. So if you need these co this, this contact information, it will be made available to you. Um, we're going to go on to our next speaker. Um, Bonnie Taylor is here today to talk to us about two um, studies. The first, CBDV, is a FPWR supported study, and that will be followed by an oxytocin study, which is currently supported by the FDA. Okay, so the first study that we're gonna talk about is CBDV, CBDV versus placebo in children and adults age 30 um, with PWS. Um, and again, my name is Bonnie Taylor um, and I'm at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Montefiore Medical Center. Um, can you forward? Okay, so CBDV, CBDV, it's similar to CBD. It's a phytocannabinoid. CBDV, it's multi-targeted, so it um, affects both the endocannabinoid system, um, endogenous non-endocannabinoid system. Um, importantly, CBDV does not have THC from the marijuana plant, so it does not create a high in your kids, um, and it's not medical marijuana. Okay, so why we think that CBDV may help um, people with PWS. So like I said, it has a lot of different mechanisms. Um, we believe it's an anticonvulsant, it's an anti-inflammatory, antioxidative, it's antipsychotic, anti-anxiety, anti-additive, and neuroprotective. So this is important. So what's different about CBDV than the CBD that you can just buy at the drugstore, right? Because anybody can buy CBD at the drugstore or on the Amazon, and a lot of people do. Um, so what's important about this study is that the CBDV that we're using, it's regulated, it's pure, we know exactly what's in it, and when you buy over the counter on Amazon, um, we don't really know what's in it, you don't really know what you're getting. Um, this is regulated. We also know, and this is important, that individuals with PWS, they're very sensitive to drugs and to drug dose. And they respond differently than people with non-PWS. And if you buy, you know, a CBD over the counter and, you know, it says to take a certain dose, that dose might not be the same as for somebody with PWS. And they may have side effects or they might be not respond or whatever the case may be. Um, so this is really a systematic study of what an appropriate dose may be with the CBDV. We're systematically assessing side effects. So we really want to know whether CBDV works and if what, what and if there are any side effects. Um, also important to know is that GW Pharma is providing the CBDV for us. GW Pharma um, has right now an FDA approved CBD. It's the only approved CBD. It's for kids with um, epilepsy. Um, so they're providing us with uh, this formulation and we're working closely with them. So we believe that primarily the CBDV is going to help with irritability and disruptive kind of behaviors. Um, and like, you know, Dr. Singh was talking about, this is really important um, characteristic and challenge in people with PWS. And although, you know, there are other med medications like antipsychotics that are often used, antipsychotics have a lot of side effects, including weight gain which is not good for people with PWS. So hopefully, you know, we're hoping that this can be another alternative. Um, we also believe that CBDV will help with repetitive behaviors, hyperphagia, rigid behaviors, and we're also gonna look at global improvement. All right, so this is um, a double blind study, a randomized study. So there is a placebo involved, it's a 12 week study. Um, so participants would be randomized to receive the CBDV or the placebo. They would stay on that for 12 weeks. They would be off the treatment for two weeks, and then we would have a remote follow-up visit. So there are four on-site visits. Um, and yes, we did reduce that as much as we possibly could, um, but there still are four visits. Um, and the reason for this is to have labs done, and GW Pharma just really makes, wants to make sure that everything is done safely. Um, for the time when you know we're hoping that we can um, put in a package to the FDA for approval, um, if it you know turns out that way. Um, so there are four on-site visits. The rest are remote visits that would be you know scattered through the uh, on-site visits. The CBDV is an oral solution. Uh, it can be mixed with food or with drinks, and the dose is weight-based. Um, so, and it's also titrated over four weeks. So it's slowly increased um, as tolerated. And then there's an eight week maintenance period. So primary inclusion criteria. 
there's no BMI cutoff for this study. There's also no nutritional phase criteria um, or inclusion criteria. Um, so participa participants should be between five and 30 years old. And again, the participant must be irritable because this is primarily where we think the CBDV is going to help. Okay. Okay, um, so it's also important that participants stay on a, a stable pharmacological, dietary, or behavioral intervention. Um, and the reason for this is because if uh, a medication were to be changed and if there were behavioral changes during the course of the study, then we wouldn't know whether those changes were due to the CBDV or the other medication that um, the participant began taking. Uh, so it's important that everything remains stable in the environment. Also physical labs uh, need to be within normal limits for PWS, okay. Exclusion, exposure to any investigational agent for in the last 30 days um, before randomization, any chronic treatment with CBD or an other endocannabinoid treatment, any primary psychiatric disorder other than autism, a history of drug abuse, a medical condition that may impact on participation and abnormalities in the blood or ECG. Um, okay, so the second trial that we're doing um, is intranasal oxytocin versus placebo for the treatment of hyperphagia in children and adolescents with PWS. So why oxytocin? So in PWS, uh, the number and the size of oxytocin producing neurons in the brain are reduced. And in mice, those with those reduced oxytocin neurons tend to overeat to the point of obesity. But then after they're administered oxytocin treatment, their food intake and their body weight decreases. Um, oxytocin has often been used in um, autism trials and it's been shown to improve social behavior, eye gaze, emotional recognition and trust in others. And it also reduces repetitive behaviors. So the, there have been studies that have been done with um, children and adults with PWS uh, using oxytocin um, as a treatment to reduce hyperphagia and there've been mixed results. Um, and probably a lot of the reason for the mixed results have been methodological differences. There have been differences in study design, sample size, doses, different outcome measures have been used. So, um, you know, that we don't have all the answers yet, but we still think that, um, you know, it could be an effective drug to treat hyperphagia. And that's why we're still, you know, looking as it, looking at it as an effective, as, um, a possible treatment. So our primary outcome measure here is hyperphagia. And then we also believe that it will help with repetitive behaviors, quality of life, um, irritability, disruptive behaviors. We're looking at weight, uh, BMI, body, comp body composition. We're also comparing salivary oxytocin concentrations with different behavioral measures. So this is an eight week double blind placebo controlled trial. Um, so uh, participants would be randomized again to receive drug or placebo. There are two on-site visits for this study and the rest are remote visits. Uh, we are enrolling 50 children and adolescents age five to 17. Uh, there's also a dose optimization in this study. So we are able to titrate the oxytocin up or down. Um, um, one, nice about thing, one nice thing about this study is that we are able to um, fund travel um, so we can cover the airfare and the hotel for the participant um, and, you know, a family member for those two on-site visits, um, and we are happy to do that. So the inclusion criteria, uh, diagnosis of PWS, age 5 to 17, nutritional phase 2B or 3, a score of at least moderately severe on the HQCT, um, stable growth hormone for at least three months, also, any other stable uh, dose hormone treatments need to be stable or metabolic treatments that could affect appetite. And um, just as with the CBDV study, stable pharmacological, dietary, or behavioral interventions and uh, labs uh, and physical within normal limits for PWS. The exclusion was um, any investigational agent before uh, 30 days, um, not receiving growth hormone, kids need to be on growth hormone, uh, children under 40 pounds, kids with uh, unstable type 2 diabetes, if it's controlled, uh, then they are eligible for the study. Unstable co-morbidities, uh, primary disorder other than autism, kids with a history of drug abuse would not be eligible, medical condition that impacts on participation, or any abnormalities in the blood or ECG. 
and here is my contact number um, and information. Please call me if you have any questions at all about any of the studies or um, anything else that you know we have been doing or are doing currently. Thank you so much, Bonnie, um, for presenting on those two studies. We had one question come in uh, regarding CVDV, which is how is irritable defined? What are parents looking for to determine if their loved one is irritable? Okay, that's a really, really good question. Um, so we would define irritability as having temper tantrums, um, becoming upset when they don't get their way, um, kids who um, are unable to cope with changes, kids who you know stomp away and get angry, um, kids who yell or scream a lot um, in inappropriate settings. So, and when you're thinking about all of these things, what's important to remember is that to compare um, your kids' behaviors to typically developing kids to determine whether that might be a, an appropriate behavior. Because often I think that parents are so, they have become so acclimated to the behaviors and it might be, behaviors might've improved from what they were in the past that they think it might not be a problem when actually it is a problem and it's causing disruption for the child's life, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does, absolutely. Are both of these studies registered on clinicaltrials.gov? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I can send you the links, yeah. That's great. I, I believe all of the studies being discussed today will have clinicaltrials.gov listings. All right, uh, let's move on to our next presenter. Next, we're going to have Jeff Dano from Harmony Biosciences. Harmony is currently enrolling for their phase two study of Patolosan. Thank you, Susan. Um, good day, everyone. And first, I want to thank um, all the patients and, and families uh, with prader willi syndrome for logging on to this session and your, your interest in the clinical trial session. Also, on behalf of Harmony Biosciences, I want to thank the Foundation for prader willi Research um, for the opportunity for us to share with you an update on our phase two trial of patolosin in patients with prader willi syndrome. Um, our trial is a little bit of a different focus than some of the other you're hearing about today with a primary outcome around excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS, but also importantly, looking at other important behavioral symptoms as, as you've heard you know, talked about um, and cognitive function. Um, next slide. So first, a little bit about Harmony, who we are. Uh, we are a pharmaceutical company. We're headquartered outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we're really dedicated to developing and commercializing innovative therapies for patients living with rare neurological diseases who have unmet medical needs. And I think, you know, very obvious to this patient family community. We were established in 2017 when we licensed the US rights uh, to a compound called Patolosin from our French partner, BioProjet. Um, Harmony became a public company last August, and uh, we're a fully integrated pharmaceutical company. And now we're um, actually up to about um, over 170 employees. And um, importantly, um, sort of with regards to the culture and what we do at Harmony, patients are at the heart of, of everything we do um, in our clinical development work, um, you know, as well as um, our commercialization uh, of uh, Patolson as an approved product for, uh, for narcolepsy. Next slide. So as I just mentioned, some background on, on Patolson, as it is approved, FDA approved for uh, a different indication, a different patient population. It's a first in class medicine and it has a novel mechanism of action and it works, it interacts with the histamine three receptor in the brain. And it works by increasing levels of histamine um, in the brain. And importantly, histamine is a major wake promoting neurotransmitter and it helps to stabilize states of sleep and wakefulness. And this is mediated in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. This is why um, you know, antihistamines, um, certain antihistamines that get into the brain, uh, that's why they are sedating and they have that sedating property because they block, they block this effect of histamine. So uh, Patolosin was first approved in Europe as Wakex in 2016 for the treatment of narcolepsy um, in adults with or without cataplexy. 
Then it was approved by the FDA um, in the US in um, August of 2019 for the treatment of excessive daytime sleepiness in adult patients with narcolepsy. Then in two and then in 2020, it was also approved for the treatment of cataplexy uh, in adults with narcolepsy. In terms of just some um, safety um, aspects of uh, patolicin, it's contraindicated in patients that have known hypersensitivity to patolicin, as well as in patients with severe liver disease. Um, from the narcolepsy development program, uh, the common side effects that were identified in the clinical trials were headache, insomnia, nausea, and anxiety. Next slide. So turning to our phase two clinical trial that we've been conducting, and it's designed to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of patolicin compared to placebo, placebo controlled trial, a, um, a sugar pill in patients ages six to 65 with PWS um, that experience excessive daytime sleepiness. And what will be, and what we are evaluating in the trial, this ongoing trial, you know, first the safety and tolerability uh, of patolicin in patients with PWS. The primary outcome is around excessive daytime sleepiness using objective measures of sleepiness. But also importantly, you know, we're looking at effects on behavior, learning, attention, and, and uh, some cognitive function, um, as well as impact on the caregivers of uh, people living with PWS. Uh, and we will be assessing as an exploratory outcome the effect of patolicin uh, on, on hunger and hyperphagia. This is a double-blind study. Uh, some patients you know, will be getting placebo or the sugar pill. Um, and uh, people participating won't know, you know which treatment they're on as part of the double-blind study. Importantly, following the double-blind portion, patients um, may be eligible to go into the open label extension, long-term open label extension, to really assess the long-term safety and effectiveness of patolicin. And in, in that part, all patients will receive patolicin, the, the study medication. We will be enrolling approximately 60 patients in this study, and we're now at 15 clinical trial sites around the country. Next slide, Susan, seen on this uh, map here. And, um, and also the travel expenses to the site that's most convenient for patients and families uh, will be reimbursed by Harmony Biosciences um, for your participation in the trial. So we'll go to the next slide. We have a short video that'll provide some of the highlights um, of the phase two trial and more information. Go ahead, Susan. If you or someone you love has Prader-Willi syndrome, you may be interested in a clinical trial open to people with PWS who are between the ages of six and 65. This trial will study the safety and effectiveness of an investigational medication and its impact on excessive daytime sleepiness, behavioral symptoms, and cognitive function. Clinics across the United States are currently enrolling participants, with more sites being added, and travel expenses to the clinic most convenient to you will be paid for by Harmony Biosciences. So what's involved? Well, that depends on whether you are the person with PWS or the caregiver. If you plan to participate, there will be five scheduled visits over the course of about four months. And if you're a caregiver, you'll accompany the person with PWS to each of the visits. For caregivers, your support and participation will be important. For example, the first visit involves an initial screening and the start of a two-week sleep diary. Making sure the diary is kept up to date will be the responsibility of the caregiver. The second visit includes nighttime and daytime sleep tests to confirm that the person with PWS is eligible for the trial. If eligible, the person with PWS will start taking their assigned study drug once daily in the morning after waking up. This could be the investigational medication or placebo. The dose will be kept in a diary, updated daily. Making sure the diary is kept up to date will be the responsibility of the caregiver. The next two visits are to assess how the person with PWS is progressing. At the last visit, the nighttime and daytime sleep tests will be given again, and then it's time to consider whether to continue into the long-term safety trial, where people with PWS will take the investigational medication and help researchers collect information. 
there will be no placebo during the long-term safety trial. Clinical trials are essential for the development of new treatments to potentially help people living with PWS. And every clinical trial starts with volunteers like you. To learn more about this trial, you can contact Harmony Biosciences at clinicaltrials at harmonybiosciences.com. Great, and Susan, we can um, go to our last slide. So I just wanna add um, also with regards to the, the clinic visits, um, as, as um, Teresa mentioned earlier, uh, we've also designed in you know, some flexibility with regards to um, you know, remote visits and other aspects um, you know, into the trial you know, uh, for those visits. So um, I want to, you know, I want to thank um, everyone in, in the prader willey community for your interest in this clinical trial session, your interest in our phase two trial of Patolosin. And uh, if you would like more information or have questions about the trial, as you just heard, you can contact um, our study team at clinicaltrials.harmonybiosciences.com. And uh, on behalf of everyone at Harmony Biosciences, again, thanks to FPWR and the opportunity to provide this update. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jeff. We always appreciate getting your information. One quick question for our families. Does your child have to fall asleep during the day? What, what, is, what, is, what is that cutoff to determine sleepiness for eligibility in this trial? So the, the cutoff is assessed by, you know, the, the objective sleep test, what's called a multiple sleep latency test. Um, and in terms of, you know, the, the observation by um, the, the parents or caregivers, um, you know, kids being sleepy, but it's hard to, you know, really know in terms of that level of sleepiness. So we use actually the, the objective test and then sub subjective scales. Um, but if there is any you know, question uh, in terms of uh, their level, the child's, you know, sleepiness during the day, whether they actually, you know, physically, you know, fall asleep or just, um, you know, complaining of being tired or they're not, you know, they're not as active um, and interested in the trial, that, you know, then they should, you know, reach out, contact us. Um, and from some of the pre-screening activity, you know, we'll be able to tell whether they potentially would be eligible and have a level of sleepiness to be eligible for the trial. Mm -hmm. and, and related to the sleepiness, do you have to have evidence of narcolepsy? Um, no, um, you, you, um, you do not. I think that um, the more we learn about the sleep-wake instability in patients with Prader-Willi, you know, the, the thing is, it's really multifactorial. Um, we know that some patients with Prader-Willi may also have a diagnosis of narcolepsy, which is a very different um, diagnosis and a, and a different disorder, you know, and there is some overlap. But patients do not have to have narcolepsy to be eligible for this trial, and that's, that's an important distinction. Uh, there are many uh, factors um, it, sort of in the brain and, and that can contribute to the excessive daytime sleepiness, which could also impact the behavioral symptoms. Um, that would be important, um, you know, to be evaluated and, and what we are evaluating in this trial um, to look at the effect of patolicin uh, on the EDS, uh, you know, not, not just related to patients with narcolepsy as a, as a separate diagnosis. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. Um, Dr. Dano will be available for Q&A at the end of the session if there's further questions for him. Coming up next, we are going to have a presentation by Dr. Elizabeth Messersmith. She's Senior Vice President and Head of, Orphan, of the Orphan Business Group at Radius Health. Hi, Susan. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you for the foundation for uh, you know, getting us all aligned to present today. Um, I want to start with, I'm Liz Messersmith. I'm Senior Vice President of the Orphan Business Group at Radius Health. And Radius Health's primary focus as a biopharmaceutical company is to help patients by developing innovative endocrine metabolic therapeutics. We are headquartered on, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and we were founded in 2003, and we became a publicly traded company in 2014. And we have approximately 300 uh, employees uh, associated with Radius. Our commercial product for osteoporosis 
is Timlos. And this is a product that we're expecting to see continued growth over this next year. However, was, as we look at Radius, one of our primary corporate objectives for 2021 and the topic that I'm most excited to talk to you about today is advancing RAT11 in an upcoming clinical study for individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome. So what is RAT11? RAT11 is an investigational man-made synthetic cannabidiol compound which has been assessed in over 150 patients across multiple indications. Now it is chemically identical to the plant extracted botanical product cannabidiol. And there are several reasons for us wanting to utilize this synthetic formulation and manufacturing process. First off is that we can really have better control over the impurity profile of the chemical synthetic process. It's more easily uh, for us to control uh, from a synthetic perspective as it does not utilize any form of the cannabis plant. In doing this, we're able to have product yields with greater than 99% in assay purity, and we exclude all those psychoactive substances of concern such as THC, cannabinol, and dronabinol. In addition, we utilize the pharmaceutical manufacturing guidelines to meet the regulatory and quality con control requirements for pharmaceutical grade products. And finally, our RAD11 formulation does not contain any alcohol in the final product, which is something that we feel is really important in considering uh, the dosing age for this indication. The manufacturing process is scalable to support uh, market needs with supply chain consistency. Now we're studying um, RAT11 in Prater-Willi because there is previous data that we had acquired through the acquisition of the product in which it had been studied in seven individuals with Prater-Willi syndrome to evaluate hyperphagia. Now, this is a small study. And in this small study, there was noted that there was a six and a half point decrease in the hyperphagia scale compared to a four point decrease with those individuals on placebo. Nicely though, on the next slide, you see that there were also changes in the average percent weight. There was a change of a weight loss of 1% in the RAT11 group compared to a positive gain of 3% in the placebo group. This change was also reflected in percent BMI change in which there was a decrease of 1.5% for the RAT11 group compared to a 2.2% increase in placebo. There were no unexpected safety signals and some patients did experience mild to moderate diarrhea during the course of the study. We feel that this observed reduction in HQCT score warrants further investigation of the possible RAT11 effects on hyperphagia. And on the next slide, we are calling our next clinical study SCOUT15, where SCOUT stands for Synthetic Cannabidiol Oral Solution. Now, the main purpose of the SCALP-15 study is determine if RAT11 can decrease that excessive desire and drive for food, as well as to characterize safety. We will look to see if RAT11 can uh, affect uh, that desire for food through the major scale of uh, change in HQCT, that hyperphagia scale that the community is so familiar with. Uh, we will also look to see how RAT11 affects the severity of Prader-Willi symptoms and how it affects the overall irritability and behavior. We will collect all the side effects that individuals may experience during the course of their treatment on RAT11 to further characterize the product safety. The design for the study is what we're calling a seamless phase two, three design investigational study. And if you think back to what Teresa was showing earlier, about the phase two, three combination, this, this study we are viewing as a pivotal registration-based study for the agency. It will be conducted obviously in individuals with Prader-Willi and we will look to uh, address some of the important aspects of Prader-Willi syndrome like hyperphagia, overall irritability and behavior. Now, this synthetic man-made cannabidiol oral solution is considered an investigational drug because it has not been approved for marketing by a health authority for the condition being studied. 
Now, the exact mechanism of how cannabidiol works in the body is not known, um, but we do know that the botanical cannabidiol that Bonnie mentioned earlier has been approved and is effective in treating other uh, central nervous system indications such as seizure-related activity. The SCALP-15 study will be uh, conducted in approximately 38 centers around the world, and it's a rather large study in comparison to what you've heard from others in that this is 220 subjects will be allowed to enroll. And we're looking at an age criteria of eight to 65 for the overall study. In this study, we will be looking in the phase two portion to evaluate three active doses and a placebo. Um, and there will be uh, six periods defined within the study. And the study individual participant will uh, be in the study for approximately 39 weeks. So we'll be looking at early response as well as long-term maintenance of effect. There will be 11 clinic visits with six remote calls or video visits. The next slide. We will evaluate, um, did we get there? Yeah. We will evaluate aberrant behavior, global impression of severity, and further characterize safety and tolerability. Um, and you can see our primary objectives will be that HQCT with the secondaries of aberrant behavior checklists, that Prater really like irritability, um, global impression of severity, the full ABC behavior, overall behavior, and soft, uh, safety and tolerability. The next slide. With this large of a study, we need to go global. So the SCALP 15 will be a global study with participation opportunities in North America, the United Kingdom, Australia, and select countries within the European Union. Our plan is to initiate, on the next slide, our study in early 2022. And we look forward to providing the community more updates on the timing um, including updates on where families can go learn to more about uh, study participation. Um, there will be more information posted on clinicaltrials.gov regarding inclusion exclusion criteria, but I could briefly say that as hyperphagia is our primary endpoint, we will be looking for some degree of consistency in the tolerability run-in period for that hyperphagia score and that will determine eligibility for the patients to enter into the dose escalation and maintenance period for treatment. At the conclusion of the SCALP-15 study, we will be offering an open label extension study called SCALP-16 um, that will continue to look at patient experience um, on time of drug. I wanna thank you for your time today, and I hope that together we can explore the potential of the investigational product, RAT11, to treat the symptoms of hyperphagia and irritability in individuals with Prader-Willi. You know, I think it's important uh, to re-emphasize, we certainly all can't do this alone. And I think we're all in this together to affect change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. We do have a question regarding sweetener that's used in the product. What type of sweetener um, is, is in the formulation? Yeah, so, um, we use a saccharin based sweetener, which doesn't, which means that we don't have to use um, uh, sucralose. And uh, the Epidiolex formulation has a different type of sweetener, which is one of the reasons why we don't need to um, uh, have alcohol in the final formulation. Mm -hmm. All right. And you did mention that Europe would have some clinical trial sites. Do you know the countries within Europe that will be available? Yeah, we're in the process of selecting those now. And we do have some that um, are going through that process. But until we're, you know, fully 100% all signed off, um, we don't want to say quite yet. Sure. And you mentioned that the trial would be opening in early 2022. Is that when we can expect to see more information about locations? Yeah, I think you'll be able to see locations hopefully by the end of this year as we're working through the process and updating our clintrials.gov posting. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for presenting today. Our next presenter is Paul Perriera. He's the Vice President of Patient Advocacy at San Iona. Hi, Paul. Hi, hi, Susan. Hi, everyone. And 
Thank you so much for having us at this conference and thanks to all the families attending. We're excited to be here and hopefully we can, we can be with you live next year. Um, today, I'd like to share with you a little information about Senona, our upcoming phase 2B trial for Testament and the work we do in patient advocacy. So who's Senona? We are a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company that focuses on discovering, developing, and ultimately delivering innovative therapies for rare disease patients. Our foundation is based on 20 years of pioneering ion channel research. And over the years, we've developed a library of more than 20,000 ion channel compounds that will fuel our rare disease research. We're advancing multiple potential new medicines through clinical and preclinical studies, including Testament, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. Our headquarters is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and we have a, an office in the US in Boston, which also houses our clinical development team. So what is Tessimate? Tessimate is a combination triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor and beta blocker. Our target indications are hypothalamic obesity as well as Prader Willi syndrome. And Tessimate works by targeting the reward and appetite centers in the brain through increasing dopamine, increasing serotonin, and increasing noradrenaline to ultimately decrease food craving, decrease appetite, but increase metabolic fat burn. Next slide, please. So here's our proposed clinical trial overview for our phase 2B study. So this will be a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial. So volunteers will be randomized into one of the four different study groups and will have an equal chance of being enrolled in one of those groups. One group will receive placebo, the second, a dose of testimate at 0.125 milligrams, the third, 0.25 milligrams, and the fourth, a higher dose of 0.375 milligrams. And then after the 16-week double-blind period, all of the volunteers, even those that are on placebo, will be given the opportunity to roll over into the 36-week open-label extension, where all of the participants will receive the highest tolerated dose of testimate. We do have sites that are planned in the U.S. and globally, and I will share with you our proposed cities in the U.S. shortly. And our primary endpoint will be change in, um, in uh, appetite through HQCT sports. So as I mentioned, here are the planned sites in the U.S. So we have proposed sites in Boston, New York, Baltimore, D.C., Atlanta, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Columbus, Ohio, Lansing, Minneapolis, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, San Diego, and Boise. Next slide, please. So in summary, we'll be performing multinational randomized controlled trials. The global testament PWS phase 2B study will open in the second half of this year. Our primary endpoint will be hyperphagia. There will be a posting on clinicaltrials.gov the second half of this year. And for more information, you can certainly ask your doctor or visit ProtterWillieSyndromeStudy.com, or you can click on the QR code and you'll be directed to a Senona sponsored webpage. And if you choose to do so, you can enter your information to sign up to receive more information. You can also authorize for a member of one of our partner teams to reach out answer your questions, and take part in a questionnaire to see if you can qualify to be included in the study. So thank you. We, we appreciate the opportunity to present to you. And uh, over the last year, your insights as a community has been so helpful to help shape our development program and even developing who we are as a company. And we'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in sharing your story with us, Please reach out to me directly is my email below, paul.perera at senyona.com. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul, for that wonderful presentation. Can you tell us the difference between a phase 2B study and a phase 2 study? Sure. So, I mean, it's essentially a phase 2 study. Um, the, it, it, so, um, 
some studies can go directly to from phase two to phase three. In this particular case, um, because there hasn't been uh, testaments a new chemical entity and hasn't been approved, the FDA recommended having a supportive phase 2B study before moving on to phase three. So essentially it's still testing, testing for safety and efficacy, but it's a step before phase three. Thank you. And has this, um, has testament been trialed in patients with PWS before? It has, there was an initial phase two uh, clinical trial where testament was generally well tolerated it produced a statistically significant reduction in hyperphagia and a reduction in body weight in adult patients, as well as dose-dependent improvements in hyperphagia and body weight in adolescents. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Again, Paul will be um, available during our Q&A for any additional questions. Next, we have our final presentation for today. Um, Andres Nethheimer from uh, Aardvark Therapeutics is here to talk to us a little bit about their clinical trial. Oh, it is Andres. I thought um, Dr. McCandless would present. My apologies, Dr. McCandless. Uh, no worries. Uh, I apologize for those of you who are looking forward to hearing Andreas talk, but hopefully I'll be able to share um, <laughs> as one of the uh, one of the investigators in this study. I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a novel, a completely novel approach to targeting the appetite and, and hyperphagia and Prader Willi syndrome uh, by um, antagon or by uh, by using a, a drug, a new compound that um, targets the bitter taste receptors. And the, the sponsor is Aardvark and the product is ARD101. Next slide, please. The, uh, the, the idea behind this, and you can see this picture here of the, of, the in, of the intestinal system. The idea behind this is that there are bitter taste receptors not only on the tongue, but throughout the entire intestinal tract. And that those bitter taste receptors, when they're activated by bitter compounds in the food that we eat, um, stimulate a variety of receptors in the intestine that, that release various hormones, many of which have been shown to be involved in the suppression of appetite, including CCK, P PYY, and the, uh, the GLP-1 and 2. And, in, and so these, the idea is that by stimulating these receptors throughout the intestine, you will be able to uh, increase the concentrations of these hormones that the gut releases that are known to suppress appetite. And in fact, in normal volunteers and in animal models, that's what's been seen as I'll show you in a minute. Because these, the compound itself is one of the most bitter tasting compounds known to man, it has to be formulated in a way where when you take it by mouth, you don't actually taste the compound until it reaches the stomach and the intestine. And then the active compound uh, which is this denotinium acetate is released. Um, as I said, in clinical studies, it not only affected hyperphagia, but also um, what appeared to be active for obesity, diabetes, and, and hyperlipidemia. And, and uh, good safety, uh, good safety in the in the phase one trial. And um, and again, it, this will be the first trial to to try it in people with Prader Willi syndrome for both efficacy and safety. May I have the next slide, please? Thanks. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but because it's a very busy slide, but really just want to show you from animal studies. These are all studies done in different mouse models of obesity, some of which are leptin receptor, receptor deficiencies and some of which are diet-induced obesity models, but all of them are mouse models of obesity. Um, and what they're showing here in the mice is that after giving the, the compound, the ARD101, the mice have less food intake compared to controls in blue. The um, animals that have even over a, a, a two month period, the, bo the body weight of the animals was markedly reduced. Um, this third 
panel here is showing that, that the effect continued over the full 60 days of treatment. There was no plateau where it didn't lose effectiveness. Um, blood, blood glucose measurements were better in those obese animals at, at, uh, by two, at the end of two months. The release of insulin was, was more appropriately modulated in the animals that were treated. Lipid panels were more appropriate, and this marker of diabetes or prediabetes hemoglobin A1c was improved. May I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the phase one study was very straightforward. Uh, healthy volunteers took a single dose, and when safety was identified for a smaller dose, they took a larger dose and then a larger dose uh, with a maximum of 240 milligrams. These were single doses. Having shown safety there, they then had healthy volunteers take the drug for 14 days at the lower dose, working up to the higher dose, and there was a very good safety profile. May I have the next slide, please? Um, a very good safety profile, even at the, high, at the highest dose, 240 milligrams twice a day for two weeks. There were no serious adverse events noted. And the uh, treatment emergent adverse events that were noted were very mild, mostly GI, um, a, a couple of skin rashes, but mostly very mild and self-limited. There were no clinically significant findings or changes in laboratory evaluations, so it didn't appear to cause elevation of liver enzymes or anything else. No changes in vital signs. Cardiac function appeared to be uh, not altered by this compound. And interestingly, more than 99% of the drug appears to stay in the digestive tract. So this compound is not readily absorbed, which means that the potential for off-target effects or what, what, what in the industry we call off-target effects, but what are really most people consider side effects should be quite low because the drug, the bulk of the drug stays in the digest, digestive tract. And that's important because that's where the mechanism of action is. You want to stimulate those bitter taste receptors throughout the entire intestine. And even in the healthy volunteers who received the drug for two weeks, the preliminary studies were able to show a significant increase in some of the gut hormones that are involved in, in uh, reducing appetite. So that's a very promising, um, very promising for the clinical trial in our are, are individuals with Potter willi syndrome. May I have the next slide, please? So this is the design of the clinical trial. You can see that there will be a total of five in-person visits. Uh, it's gonna be a small trial because this is an early stage uh, phase two trial. So it's really primarily about safety as you can see here, but we will be looking at the hyperphagia, uh, quotient, the hyperphagia, hyperphagia questionnaire for clinical trials, as well as body weight to see if there's any evidence of a signal there. And then we'll be looking at a variety of other markers, uh, which will be informative for planning the bigger phase three trial, which will follow, uh, we hope, um, if, if this drug appears to have effectiveness and is safe. May I have the next slide, please? Um, the, the, in, the eligibility criteria, we will enroll males and females ages uh, uh, from 17 to 65 years with uh, confirmed diagnosis of Potter willi syndrome. Uh, blood pressure and vital signs need to be stable. Um, uh, diabetes managed with insulin is going to be an exclusion criteria for this particular phase of the study until we have more information about the effect of altering these gut peptides on, um, on insulin release, because many of them uh, also affect insulin release, and we just don't want there to be any confusion. Um, uh, need to have blood glucoses that are in the, in the non-diabetic range. Um, stable body weight, meaning uh, uh, no excursions of greater than 10% in the two months prior to enrollment. Um, and then uh, laboratory tests need to be normal and vital signs need to be normal. And then uh, any medications need to have been at a stable dose for the three months before entering the trial. May I have the next slide, please? 
Uh, and that's really it. This, this will be, there will be two sites to try to reach the 12 uh, patients quite quickly and get this finished so we can move on uh, with a larger study. The two sites will be at Stanford in uh, Palo Alto, California, and here in Denver at my institution at the at Children's Hospital Colorado. And uh, thank you for your attention and uh, sticking through this fascinating session. Uh, and I look forward to taking any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. McCandless. That was a very good presentation. I like how you highlighted information for us. Um, quick question about this particular clinical trial. Was the phase one conducted in patients with PWS? No, the, this will be the first study where people with Prader-Willi syndrome received the drug. All of the people in phase one were healthy volunteers. Great, thank you so much. Um, at this time, I'm going, to, I'm going to invite all of our panelists to return back um, to our presentation. We have a few minutes to take um, Q&A for anybody. Um, we had one, actually, we've had a lot of questions coming in in regards to um, whether, um, whether these are international studies. Uh, perhaps we could get a quick round. Which studies are available to folks outside of the U.S.? Okay, so, so, we, so, so our, our study is being planned as a global study, and I mentioned, you know, Canada, sites in Canada, sites in Australia, the UK, and then select countries in, in the EU, which we're still kind of sorting out which ones those are. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, so Susan, the current, the current phase two trial for Patolosin is, is just at US, in US sites. Um, if we have the opportunity to go on to a phase three you know, pivotal trial, uh, we will likely um, be going you know, international and um, you know, have sites outside the US as well. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, the phase two B trial for testament will be in the US as well as outside of the US. Okay, and Paul, the locations will be made available. I know you mentioned, you showed some in the US, but the international Correct. locations will be made available shortly. Correct, absolutely. And can people use that QR code to get that information later on? It, it won't be available um, just yet if they go through it, but if they register their interest, they'll be sure to receive information when it's available. All right, what about Canadians? If they wanted to travel down to the US, are they eligible to participate? Well, in our study, we are looking to have geographies in Canada that cover both coasts and the little in between. So I suppose, you know, I think it all is going to depend on patients, you know, whether it's easier for them to fly to someplace just over the border or, or find something within their, their local region. Mm -hmm. For guanfacine, we've had patients show interest uh, coming in from Canada and we should, as long as there are only three on-site visits, as long as they're able to travel for those three, we are able to uh, accommodate their needs. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question regarding oxytocin. Um, there's been multiple publications regarding completed studies in oxytocin. Some have said that it's non-effective, others have shown some efficacy. Why is it believed that oxytocin could be effective in this case, Bonnie? Yeah, um, so one thing that's different about this trial than the other trials is that we do have the opportunity to optimize the dose. So if we see side effects, we'll lower the dose. And if we see um, it's not effective, we can increase the dose, which hasn't been done before. Um, so, and we still, I mean, our, our feeling is that it's still, very much could be an effective medication for hyperphagia and also for you know the repetitive behaviors and rigidity as well. Mm -hmm. So we would like to continue investigating it. Okay, thank you. Dr. Singh, there were some questions regarding guanfacine because it's, it is a um, FDA approved drug and, and dosing and contraindications. How can a person get more information if they're interested in guanfacine? So yeah, you know, uh, I've been talking about guanfacine for years now, but uh, but I think uh, it's there's uh, been uh, a hesitation in in psychiatrists, uh, other than folks who are, who are familiar with PWS, in prescribing guanfacine to patients with PWS because they're so used to 
prescribing, say, antipsychotics for the same symptoms of aggression and irritability, kind of like not realizing how dangerous it could be because of weight gain, etc. So, um, you know, I think education, um, you know, you can, uh, uh, the, the ultimate education would be if we can demonstrate and spread the word about how effective guanfacine is based off of this trial. But in the meantime, if you're not able to enroll in the study, um, you can talk to, you can ask your provider the question about whether or not they're aware of guanfacine and if they want, if they, can sort of look up the fact that uh, there is, it might be a, uh, an alternative and sometimes a better alternative to some of the other medicines that they're trying. Um, however, I, I do, I mean, this is a short trial. I think it'd be best if they can come in and get the education themselves in person. And for the patients, just very quickly, the patients who are enrolled, who've completed the trials with us, we are uh, actually communicating with the clinicians who are taking care of them, say in Denver or uh, you know in other areas. I'm happy to communicate with them and, and tell them how to titrate the medicines going forward so that they don't have to continue coming in. And that will be the way to spread, edu spread education to other clinicians as well. Sure. You know, I would I would add that while guanfacine is a currently F, you know, it is FDA approved, this trial is so incredibly important because. As Dr. Singh has mentioned, a lot of psychiatrists are not necessarily familiar with PWS specifically and the appropriate dosing of drugs specific to PWS. So what we want to be able to do is complete a clinical trial, get it published in the literature, and then you as a parent can take that publication to your psychiatrist and say, look, this is the drug that works. This is what it says. And it's not just a parent talking to a doctor anymore. Now you have this publication and you can work with your psychiatrist in, in finding that right medication for your loved one. Um, you know, we have another question again. We have a lot of international families who really want to access clinical trials. Um, let's, let's, let's generalize this question a bit more. Can you cross country lines? to participate in the clinical trial. So if there's a clinical trial anywhere in the world, can I participate in it if I'm willing to travel there? I guess I could I could take this one. I don't know if you guys want to add on to it, but I think a lot of it's gonna depend on the institutional's um, regulations for IRBs and consenting processes, right? So to me, that's the biggest kind of barrier that people have to consider. Uh, in some cases, it can be allowed. In other cases, it's going to be very country and site specific. Okay. I don't know. Other experts on the line? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, yeah, I would agree with that. And, and maybe, Sean, maybe you can, you know, share at your institution, um, you know, what the position is on that. But yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think that, you know, that is more sort of the rate limiting factor there. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Jeff. I, I, I would agree with that. And I think from the investigator's perspective, uh, just as Liz said, the IRB, uh, the informed consent form will be in, has to be in a language which the subject enrolling in the study is able to speak fluently enough that they can, that you can be confident that they understand the information that's in these informed consents, if you haven't done one, they're often 15, 20 pages long, at least at my institution. Um, and so typically uh, the, you need to, the lang there needs to be no language barrier. And then the other issue, for, at least in our institution, is gonna be the cost and safety. Um, if we're using a drug where we have any concerns about safety, we wanna make sure that, that, that we will be able to get you the care that you need wherever you are um, should there be an adverse event uh, that occurs, and so that, um, so the cost of the cost of travel for the visits, the 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 informed consent form, and the, any there there can't be any language barriers, and then the safety issues, and the safety issues are always going to be up to the individual investigator. So the sponsor might say, oh yeah, we're fine to have people fly from from uh, Thailand to. To, to Denver to do this study, but if I don't feel that that's safe or were appropriate for the patient, then we would have to say no. The other issue, the other issue that we've run into is that um, patients can't take non-approved 
treatments over the border. Mm. Right, so you have to be able to travel with this medication. Yeah, okay. I think this points to the, the value in if you're interested in a clinical trial and contacting the site that you're interested in going to and having that discussion. So I would, you know, I mean, I think it's great for all of our international families to be interested and hopefully many of them will have opportunities if not in their own country, uh, in other countries, but it, but as you can see, it's quite complicated. And so there'd have to be a lot of planning and that's where a, a good discussion about logistics, as well as these issues around safety and care in your home country, for example, would need to be addressed. But I would just encourage families to, you know, to do that homework and see if it is feasible uh, and if it makes sense for them. Absolutely. And Teresa, great lead way here. Um, if you're looking for more information or you're interested in participating in a clinical trial, we really encourage you to do some homework and um, check, you know, get some more information. I've included on this slide the link to our clinical trials directory. It's also been shared in the chat. These slides will be made available to everyone after um, today's presentation. But in this directory, it has, you know, some very simple information as far as eligibility, um, locations that the trial is taking place. And of course, contact information. If you're interested in a trial and you have information, please, or if, you have, if you're interested in a trial and you have a question, please reach out to the contact individual for the study that's listed in the directory or go to clinicaltrials.gov um, and contact them. They wanna hear from you. They will wanna answer your questions. Um, and of course, if you're eligible, we wanna get you into these studies because frankly, it's, it's on us. Um, the members of the PWS community to get these studies enrolled and to do so as quickly as possible. This is how we're going to get treatments for our loved ones. Um, so please share this information with everyone um, and if, if eligible participate as well.